On this episode of Five Things, we'll look at the 2018 Mac Mini and the new eGPU Pro from Blackmagic. Will these work for post-production? Let's find out now. Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Things, a web series dedicated to answering the five burning tech questions that you have about technologies and workflows in the media creation space, plus tech stuff I dig and how it's used. I'm still your host, Michael Thomas, and today we're checking out the 2018 Mac Mini from Apple and the eGPU Pro offering from Blackmagic and, well, Apple. We're also running benchmarks against your favorite, or least favorite, NLEs. Final Cut 10, DaVinci Resolve, Adobe Premiere Pro, and Avid Media Composer. Let's get to it. What better machine to test how well an external GPU works than with a machine that has a horrible built-in GPU? Yes, tech friends, the powerful top-of-the-line 2018 Mac Mini is built on Intel technology, which means there's a small GPU on the chip. While this GPU, the Intel UHD Graphics 630, isn't going to break any performance records, it does provide a user with a basic way to feed their screen without a third-party graphics card. The Mac Mini also rocks USB-C for Thunderbolt 3 access. It's this 40 gig connection that provides the bandwidth for an eGPU to shine. Slower I.O., like Thunderbolt 2 or even older connections, simply don't provide enough bandwidth to accommodate all that a modern GPU can provide. The new Mini provides four USB-C Thunderbolt 3 ports, enough for up to two eGPUs. I also dig the legacy USB 3 ports too, as we all have peripherals like keyboards and mice that still rock the legacy USB Type-A. Back to throughput, the 2018 Mac Mini also has an option for a 10 gig E copper connection. I know, many signify 10 gig E as a sign that it's for professionals. Quite frankly, 10 gig E is the new one gig E, so if you haven't been looking into it, now would be a good time. The Mini has many different options, from an entry-level i3 processor to the mid-range i5 to the i7 model that I tested with. The units can be configured with four or six cores and speeds of up to 4.6 gigahertz in turbo boost mode. For RAM, the 2018 Mini supports up to 64 gig, although you may need to take it to an Apple store to get it installed. You can also build your system out with up to a two terabyte PCIe SSD. My testing unit was the six core i7 with 32 gigs of RAM. I ran some benchmarks on the mini and compared the results with other Geekbench scores of other popular Apple machines. Here, we have a top of the line 2013 Mac Pro and a maxed out 2017 MacBook Pro, plus my Hackintosh build from a few episodes back. You can see that the 2018 Mac Mini is apparently no slouch when it comes to performance. Plus, it helps that the last Mac Pro is over five years old. Let that sink in for a moment. During testing, I was alerted to the fact that the Mini will throttle the chip speed when the unit hits about 100 degrees, so if you push the system too hard, the performance will suffer via the reduced speed. That kind of blows. Now, there are a ton of in-depth 2018 Mac Mini reviews out there, and let's face it, you're really here for the eGPU Pro and video post-production stuff, so let's move on to that now. Like the non-pro model before it, the eGPU Pro from Blackmagic simplifies the addition of enhanced graphics processing by putting a GPU in an external enclosure. Also, like the previous model, the Pro has an 8GB card in it, albeit with a faster 8GB card than the Radeon Pro 580 in the previous gen. The new GPU is the Radeon RX Vega 56. Now, both models are meant to capitalize on the metal playback engine, as opposed to OpenCL or CUDA. The eGPU Pro also features a display port, unlike the non-Pro version. This allows for up to 5K monitoring if you so desire, as the HDMI 2.0 port tops out at 4K DCI at 60 frames a second. Both units come with four USB 3 ports and a spare USB-C Thunderbolt 3 port, so you can connect even more peripherals through the eGPU. Now this sucker is damn quiet. 
Aside from a small white LED indicator at the bottom of the unit and an icon in the menu bar, you wouldn't even know the unit is running. The unit is mostly a massive heatsink, so expect heat to come pouring out of the top. The eGPU Pro ships with a one-foot USB-C cable. This cable is very short, which means this unit is always going to be next to your computer. And while I didn't test it, I understand longer USB-C cables can cause issues, so stick with the cable that came with the unit. While the eGPU Pro is cool looking, it's pretty hefty and does take up valuable desktop real estate. It also dwarfs gear next to it, like the Mac Mini. In fact, it's larger than a 2013 Mac Pro, among other things. What is uniquely different, however, is that the eGPU Pro is only certified to work with Mac OS 10.14 Mojave. I like this, as support in OS 10.13 High Sierra for eGPUs was a crapshoot at best. Interestingly enough, nothing needs to be installed in Mojave for the eGPU Pro to run. The GPU drivers are built into the OS. In fact, the eGPU Pro comes with no drivers or software to install. I tested with a pre-shipping model of the Pro. In fact, the packaging was still for the non-Pro version. As such, there was no documentation or quick start guide with the unit. No, it's in the field manual. You can check it out if you want to. But well, we seem to be out of field manuals, sir. Perhaps you can enlighten us. The ship date for the eGPU Pro has now slipped a month, from November 2018 to December 2018. Perhaps code is still being written for Resolve and Final Cut 10, as I did find a few issues. In fact, let's check those out now. In order to come up with a baseline to show the differences, let's start with Final Cut 10 with no eGPU, just the onboard Intel graphics utilizing the recently released Final Cut Pro 10.44 version. We'll start with a single stream of ProRes 422 HQ at 2398. This, this clip is UHD days, and five minutes long, and it seems to play just fine. You can see the system isn't being taxed too much. This is because ProRes is intra-frame, which means all the information for each frame is within that one frame, so it's easier to decode in the fly. Uh, this is why most editors prefer it over inter-frame codecs, also known as long GOP. Now let's try putting an effect on it, like a blur. Nope. Okay, well, we hit our playback baseline kind of early. Well, before we test with an eGPU, let's test a simple render of that blur. Well, I won't make you wait. Wow, over 25 minutes for a render. Yikes. That's over five times slower than the actual five-minute clip. Well, let's try exporting now. I normally do all of my exports via compressor. First off, this allows me to use a network cluster if I so choose, but it also frees up the Final Cut 10 app in the event there's more work I want to do within Final Cut 10. Let's do a common export, a H.264 YouTube export. Oh boy, this is going to take a while too. Let's fast forward and see how long this takes. 50 minutes, wow, 10 times slower than real time. Well, it's obvious the Mini isn't going to be a render and export powerhouse. Let's connect the eGPU and see how much more we can get out of the system. First, we set the app preference at the OS level for preferred external GPU usage. The activity monitor shows the eGPU is seen. So just like before in Final Cut 10.4.4, we'll load up the same timeline, the 5-minute ProRes file, with the blur applied, and we'll see if that plays uh, with the external eGPU connected. About using a Hackintosh? Wondering how and there doesn't seem to be any movie. issue with that playing. You want to build one. Fear not, my tech friends, for on this episode, we've got you covered. Let's make things a little bit more complicated. We'll start a new timeline, and I happen to have some 5K red material, uh, which is red code. Uh, we'll also drop a color effect on there and see how that plays. And there doesn't seem to be any issue with this playing at all. We can see the eGPU is being pegged a little bit. Let's make things a little bit more interesting. Let's put another color effect on there, and we'll see how that plays in real time. And again, there doesn't seem to be any issue uh, with this media playing. Uh, let's do a little bit more damage to this timeline. Let's put another color effect on there. And as you can see, it's playing just fine. All right, let's make things even more complicated. 
I have some iPhone footage here, which is UHD. We'll resize that and put a color effect on there. I also have some XAVC footage at uh, UHD. We'll resize that, put some color effects on there and play that. And it's just fine. Now let's do an export and we'll send a compressor. But before that, we want to make sure that we've told compressor to actually use the external eGPU. So we'll do a get info on the app. We'll select prefer external GPU. And then we'll back in Final Cut 10, we'll do a send a compressor. In this case, I'll use the same preset, uh, YouTube preset, and we'll hit go. Hmm. Hmm, it's not going very fast. And look, it's still using the internal GPU, not the eGPU, even though we told it to. What you didn't see here is that I rebooted and retried this with the same result. Score one for Funnel Cut 10, but not Compressor. We're now going to benchmark Resolve 15. Uh, we're going to do some tests that are very similar to what we did in Final Cut 10. First, we're going to check out the preferences so you can see that we're using the onboard GPU on the Mac Mini, uh, not the external eGPU. Uh, we have a sequence here much like we had in Final Cut 10. This is the same five minute ProRes sequence in UHD resolution. Uh, you can see that it's playing. You can see that we're not dropping any frames. We're staying at the constant 24 frames per second that we're running. And you can see we are hitting the onboard GPU. Now we're going to put a blur on here and we're going to see how Resolve handles it. Not so much. It's already dropping down to under seven frames a second. So that's about the top end of the GPU. Next, we'll do a render test and I'll speed that up so you don't have to wait around. That clocks in at eight minutes and 44 seconds. Not too bad. Now let's do an export into a 1080p H.264 file for YouTube. And that clocks in at just over nine minutes at nine minute and one second. Now we need to connect the eGPU and make sure the Resolve app sees it. Now that we're sure the app is seeing the external GPU, we're gonna launch Resolve, go into our benchmarking project and see if performance is any different. First, we'll check our preferences so you can see that the eGPU is being seen by the system and it is. First thing we'll do is play back the same sequence we had before, the five minute ProRes file, and we'll see how that plays. On this episode of Five Things, have Seems you to be playing fine. I don't see any drop frames. Now it's time to put on an effect. We'll put the same blur Wondering on. How they perform, or maybe, just maybe, and it's holding steady. No one. dropped Fear frames. My tech friends, for on this episode, we now we'll do the render test again, and I'll speed that up so you don't have to sit around and wait for it. That's pretty good. Five minutes, 15 seconds. Not too bad. Now let's try the same 1080p export for YouTube. That's not bad either. Two minutes, 39 seconds. So we're definitely seeing some massive improvements. We're now going to put on a rather intense grade for this free version of Resolve, including four nodes that uh, Jason Bodosh came up with for me. And as we play this back, you'll see that we're getting close to full frame rate. We're dropping a few frames here or there. So it looks like we should take off one of the nodes to see if performance increases. We'll take off this dead pixel fixer here at the end and we'll play it again and see what we get. So do I. So it looks so like we're playing at full frame rate. This is great. Resolve is really taking advantage of the eGPU and the performance is so much better than the onboard Intel UHD Graphics 630. Since Adobe and Avid weren't part of the super special eGPU club with Apple and Blackmagic, how would these tools fare? 
Let's see, and we'll start with Adobe Premiere Pro. We're doing this test with Premiere Pro 2019, and we've got the same timeline we've had in the other NLEs. The five minute UHD ProRes sequence uh, with the onboard GPU, and you'll see we're not dropping any frames, and we're playing back at full quality. So Premiere is utilizing the onboard GPU. Now it's time to put on an effect. We'll do a blur, and we'll see how Premiere plays. It looks pretty good. And if we also look, we're not dropping any frames and still at full frame rate. So it looks like we can beat up on this a little bit more uh, than we had with some of the other systems. So let's throw on a LUT. Let's throw on a look and see how it looks. Let's hit play, and that's the baseline. You can see we're dropping frames pretty steadily uh, at full quality. Uh, 52 frames, actually. Let's try and drop down the quality to half and see if playback is any better. We've got you covered. And yeah, it looks like Adobe's uh, eking through there. If I drop the playback down to half quality, we're still getting a green circle, so that means we're not dropping any frames. So that's pretty good utilization of the onboard uh, GPU. Let's again do a render, and I'll fast forward past this so you don't have to wait. That took 13 minutes, 11 seconds, which uh, isn't bad, but it's uh, not great either. You know what? Let's try the export now. We'll use Adobe Media Encoder for the export using the 1080p YouTube preset. Again, I like using the external transcoders uh, because then we get to uh, keep working in Premiere if we wanted to. And I'll fast forward past this so you don't have to wait. Looks like the export comes in at just around 13 minutes, which uh, isn't fantastic, but it's not great either. We're now gonna connect our eGPU and see how we can get this bad boy to perform. Uh, right now, I'm gonna layer two tracks of ProRes video. I'm gonna put LUTs on each of them. I'm also gonna do a resize. And it looks like it's playing just fine. Let's try some other footage. Let's try some 4K iPhone footage. We'll do the same thing. Two streams of video, both with LUTs and a resize and it looks like the system can't handle it. So it looks like we're somewhere between two streams of ProRes and two streams of iPhone footage with effects. Now we're gonna try and do the render into out. We'll do the render test, and again, I'll fast forward past it so you don't have to wait for it. And that's actually much faster, clocking in at six and a half minutes. Now let's try the same 1080p export. Huh. It seems we're using the onboard graphics more than the external GPU, but we are getting this done faster. Uh, this came in a little bit over nine minutes. For our last round of benchmarks, we're gonna use Avid Media Composer. Uh, we're using version 12.2018. It's a beta, so it's the most recent version I can get my hands on. And, whoa, that's interesting. It looks like the minimum spec for GPU is not met by the onboard GPU of the Mac Mini. So all GPU effects are disabled. Yikes. All right, well, let's change our playback quality to full and we'll play the same five minute ProRes clip. It looks good. We're not dropping any frames. Maybe, just maybe, so let's put an effect on there. Let's put a LUT on there. We'll drop that on there and see how playback goes. On this episode of Five Things... Ah, uh, we're definitely dropping some frames. Hackintosh? Let's zoom in and see what uh, we're dropping. And yes, we're taxing the processor pretty hard uh, because the GPU is not being used and you can see we're dropping frames. Like Premiere, let's try dumping down our playback quality uh, to see if uh, Media Composer can chomp through it. We're in green-yellow mode right now, and it looks like we're playing it. So if we reduce the playback uh, quality, we can play it. Now we'll do a render test. We'll make sure that our render settings are set to the right codec. We'll start the render, and so you don't have to wait. The render comes out to seven minutes and 41 seconds. And as you can see, uh, it's only using the CPU because of course the GPU was disabled. With those tests done, let's connect the eGPU and go back into Avid. We'll go back up to the uh, info tab and see if anything's changed. Huh, that's interesting. 
Avid told me that eGPUs weren't recognized, but it is being seen. So let's roll with it. Let's see what happens. The five minute ProRes UHD clip seems to be playing just fine. No dropped frames. Let's put a LUT on there again and see how that plays. On this episode of Looks like we're dropping frames and we're barely using, using the external eGPU. If we zoom in here, you'll see a lot of red and a lot of yellow, which is no bueno. Uh, that means the system is not keeping up with the media. All right, let's now do a render test. And that's going really slow. And as I'm looking at the activity meters, it's only hitting the CPU. It's not utilizing the GPU at all. Uh, which means I'm not really going to get any good data and good results from this uh, because the times aren't going to be that different. So I'm just going to cancel this. Um, I'm also not going to do an export because exports uh, with Avid are still through the 32-bit QuickTime engine, which isn't going to use the eGPU or an onboard GPU at all. So I'm just not going to do that test. That's a lot of data to crunch. It's obvious that despite the initial high benchmarks via Geekbench, the 2018 Mac Mini, on its own, doesn't really have a fit for creative uses in post, unless it's used as a file server or perhaps a lone Mac in a sea of Windows machines when you need an easy way to create ProRes files. I concede that it may work for story producers or predators, but I find that it's never good practice to hit the upper limits of a new machine from day one. I should also note that the 2018 Mac Mini is not qualified by all NLE manufacturers. Avid hasn't qualified it as of now, and it doesn't meet the minimum specs that Adobe publishes. The DaVinci Resolve manual for Blackmagic calls out specifically that the Mini should not be used. Apple's requirements for Final Cut 10, on the other hand, are barely met by the Mini's specs. Personally, I'd save the two grand this machine cost and put that towards an iMac or an iMac Pro, or maybe, just maybe, the highly anticipated 2019 Mac Pro. But I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. I'd like to put more in that jar. That's where you come in. Now, as for the eGPU, it's important to remember that all of this is new. This was essentially a science experiment. Mojave, as of this episode, is only at 1014.1. Apple, one of the partners in this eGPU collaboration, still doesn't have all the bugs worked out, as Compressor doesn't appear to even use it. That being said, speed increases in Final Cut 10 and Resolve are undeniable, and certainly showcase the speed that a good GPU can bring to the post table. Adobe, while not part of the Apple and Blackmagic eGPU soiree, also show speed benefits out of the box, and that's before Adobe has done any optimization for it. That's pretty impressive. Avid, on the other hand, has never been a GPU powerhouse. My tests only really show that Avid has some serious engineering to do to incorporate eGPUs into future releases. Now, if this eGPU Pro solution could breathe life into an old system, I might be more inclined to suggest it. However, the fact that you need a relatively recent Thunderbolt 3 enabled machine makes that old system label inappropriate. Now, you can roll your own eGPU by using a third-party external chassis and compatible graphics cards. They can be parted out and purchased for under $800 on the street, $400 cheaper than the eGPU Pro. And while I don't expect an all-in-one solution to be the same cost as a DIY, a $400 Delta is too big of a chunk to ignore. The only real time I can suggest a solution like this is for folks who edit on a MacBook or MacBook Pro. Those road warriors who are on the go and editing, but need to come back home at some point and do some serious heavy lifting. But is that market large enough? Gaming and other GPU-enabled applications have a much wider reach than the post community. Regardless, I'm excited to see if in 12 to 18 months, NLEs have been able to start utilizing eGPUs better than they do from day one. Have more eGPU Pro and Mac Mini questions other than just these five? Ask me in the comments section also. Please subscribe and share this tech goodness with the rest of your techie friends. 
Until the next episode, learn more, do more. Thanks for watching.